Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. We have two presenters today in this session, Cindy Etherton and Chelsea Williams from Oregon State University College of Education. We are very excited to have them as our presenters today. We also have Tammy Marino and Nina Fox from the board joining me as co-hosts. Um, the three of us will help monitor the chat and Q&A areas. Um, you're all muted during the webinar, but if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, please feel free to send them our way. We don't have closed captioning for the live event, but closed captioning will be added in post-production. And the recording will be posted on our website. So. Um, you can share the news with your colleagues if they can't attend, um, they can check out the recordings. Okay, now I am going to turn the mic over to Chelsea and Cindy. Well, I am super excited to be able to be with you all today. Um, I think this is such an important topic and one that Chelsea and I have spent many, many uh, conversations uh, centered around. So it's great that we can spend time together. Yeah, and my name is Chelsea Williams, and I'm excited to be here as well. Uh, I work for Oregon State University, as Weiwei said, and uh, currently I work with um, educators, teachers, and helping them to uh, do do better um, at what we all do, which is which is teach. So we we uh, together uh, teach classes around um, e-learning and all different types of things that impact. Um, educators. So that's what I do on a normal basis and I get to be lucky to work with Cindy on a regular basis and I'm excited to co-host with her today. Yeah, no, I think it's going to be a great conversation. So um, those of you that have joined us, if you want to just continue that conversation in the chat by sharing with us where you're coming from or what you're hoping to get out of today, it would be lovely to be able to see that. And um, just a, by way of quick introduction, I am a um, a uh, K-12 educator as well as in higher ed and I have also migrated as an instructional designer to the uh, corporate space as well. So if you are someone that's here as a K-12 educator, just know that I, um, my heart is with you. <laughs> you got a heavy lift right now. Yeah. Um, all right, well, and with that said, our higher ed uh, partners are certainly, um, certainly have that heavy lift as well, especially as everybody's transitioning. Yes, that's one of my other things, I do. among other things that we all do as teachers when we juggle so many things, but I also teach um, communication courses for Lynn Benton Community College um, part-time as well as work for Oregon State, so I'm with y'all in there. <laughs> um, all right, so as we're, we're talking a little bit about, you know, this substantive uh, interaction, it implies that we are making sure that we're connecting as people and and what that looks like as being a human. And so we're going to need a little bit of help um, in that process of just understanding what you all um, envision. You know, what does it mean to be human? We can, you know, is it because we live in a house? Is it because we uh, use words to communicate? And so, um, so I just want us to just sort of start there so that we can really hone in on the important elements of what that can look like together. So, um, so what we'd like you to do is to go ahead and use this tool here that you see on your screen. You can use a mobile device and uh, take a quick picture of the, the um, QR code, that weird looking square, um, and that should take you directly to the website. You can also go to menti.com and the code is uh, available as well. Thank you, Chelsea, for putting that there. And then there, I've also put in the, uh, the chat as well, a direct link to that location. So we'll give you all a, a couple of moments to get to that space um, so that you are able to uh, share with us your thoughts on what it looks like and means to be human. <clears throat> and just for clarity, whoops. Uh, just for clarity, we're going to go ahead. You know you're in the right spot. If this is what you see, 
and um, GIFs just. <laughs> so hopefully you see someone shrugging their shoulders. <laughs> and we'll take a look at what you all are seeing here in just a moment. Cindy, there's a comment in the chat saying the site is not working with the code. Ah, well, let's see. Yeah. I think if they just follow your link, that would be the easiest. It, yeah, let's, let's go ahead for some reason. Let's go ahead and, um, and try this code. I don't know why, but, you know, um, <clears throat> I, I, one of the the, <laughs> the the codes that I have often followed is, you know, if the plan B doesn't work, you move on. So um, if you want to share with, um, with us your thoughts on what is it in one or two words um, to be human, please feel free to put that in the chat as well if that's useful for you. What we are curating together is, um, a word cloud. And there's a follow-up comment saying the direct link works, so. Oh, fantastic. That's good. Yeah. Good. Let's... And there we go. We're working on it. <laughs> I love a tool like this because it extends our conversation very quickly um, and, you know, and, and, and I appreciate your thoughts on, you know, it's the thinking, it's the feeling, those are the pieces that add uh, that human element. Um, I think that's fantastic add. And again, in this word cloud environment, we're able to quickly have that conversation uh, collectively. And as a reminder, word clouds, words get larger if they are used more than once. And so then we can really see uh, the power of that in the process. Yeah. There's another uh, uh, service that does this as well called WooClap, uh, similar to menti.com that does the same thing. And I participated this morning in my very first workshop um, at Lynn Benton, and we did the same exercise and we didn't realize at the time that, oh, one of the, one of the folks asked, why do I keep seeing connection? Because that's how many times the more you see it, the larger the word gets. So that's kind of a cool thing about this. These are some great words. Yeah, I totally agree. yes. Evolution, excellent word. Mm. Also, honesty, discernment, one of my favorite words. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that meaning making, you know, the, the making sense of our world. Yeah. One of the uh, panelists asked Danielle, thank you, if she wants to use Minty in her class, how does she do that? Um, when she goes to the website, it asks for a code. So does she do what you did, just give a code? Um, so if you were using this uh, and creating it yourself, uh, minty.com uh, is a free source. It's a free tool, um, which most of us can pay for every day, which is lovely. <laughs> and, um, and then once those are built, uh, built out, and there's a variety of ways for that to happen, um, you just simply share it, and then you get your QR code as well as the, the uh, general code, that little square, as well as, you know, the number code and the specific uh, link to this uh, or to your, um, your question. Yeah. So yeah, and so it can be left open for a, uh, a longer period of time or you can have it um, just cut off at a specific point in time. So again, it's real flexible that way. So it looks like we've got lots of words. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. All right. so. We're gonna let you you all continue in that space if that's useful. And um, and if uh, Tammy or Weiwei or Nina, if one of you could do a screenshot of that and um, maybe use and 
send that to Chelsea or myself or both of us, uh, we'll be sure to share our end result with everybody when we share uh, these resources that we're, we're offering today. All right. So, you know, at, as we're kind of thinking about um, this substantive um, interaction, it really is all about that humanness that we were talking about earlier. And so we're going to use that word, uh, human, and, as an acronym. And we're going to kind of highlight some important and useful ways um, as we're exploring tools and strategies and um, around this idea. Um, Chelsea, did you want to talk about Brene Brown? Yeah, so one of the, uh, many of you may have heard of Brene Brown and her work on compassion and empathy. And whenever I'm teaching a course, uh, I try to bring in as much compassion and empathy, you know, those social emotional learning skills. And I think that's important here as well when we're, when we're talking about bringing in substantive. We're not just talking about different tools and apps. We're also talking about bringing in ourselves, right? That's what the acronym for human is. And so Renee Brown has a fantastic video on empathy and sympathy, the difference between those two. And it's only about two minutes long, and I usually share it in an interpersonal communication class, but I could see it being shown in all different types of classes just to talk a little bit about um, how we learn, you know, and learning means that uh, we, we fail up, right? We're gonna make mistakes. So I love that video uh, if, and I, will, I can share the link in the chat uh, if, if you would like to see it or many of you may have seen it, but it, it is um, fantastic. And I think it's a great resource to share with your students as well. And we'll, we'll offer that as part of our, um, our resources that you'll be receiving when you receive this recording as well. Yeah. All right, so let's start with H. And so, you know, let's, let's concentrate on uh, students and that whole failing up and the vulnerability that comes with that. And um, so the first suggestion that we would have for you is just providing those clear expectations for students. You know, that could be as, as basic as providing uh, rubrics. Um, if you are part of a Google environment, um, one of my favorite uh, tools is called Orange Slice. Uh, it's a funny name, but essentially if I hand out a Google document to a group of students, everybody gets, um, if, if you've been teaching a while, uh, there may have been a time in your life where you would stamp the top of a paper with a rubric and then you write on it. This is sort of that same concept. It puts a table at the top and you literally click in each square based on uh, the proficiency that a student has given. And then you can give uh, personalized comments after that. So if you put it at the base of your uh, so, for example, if you're using a Google Classroom environment, um, every student that receives a copy gets their own rubric at the top. So it's a it's a fantastic option. Um, you know, there's an awful lot of educators in the Northwest that are using um, Canvas. So that speed grader uh, and the rubrics that are included in that, again, it's sharing with students so that they're autumn not so that they have the opportunity to be successful initially. Um, it's not a guess and check. It's here's what I'm expecting to see, and these are the these are the scores based on that. Um, and you know, again, there's lots of other LMSs that have those built-in um, rubric options. Yeah, and we'll share that as well. And one of the things I do also um, in terms of keeping clear expectations, especially if I'm teaching online, is what do I expect from a student if we're teaching face to face? If I'm teaching in that. Um, synchronous environment, like we're talking right now, um, and what do I expect if not? So um, not only just in terms of assignments, but what your expectations are of them and the way that they show up in your classroom, whether it's virtual or face-to-face -face classroom. Mm. Yeah, no, that's important. Um, another really great feedback tool, and I'll just mention this briefly, it's called Kaizena, which is a uh, two uh, conjoined uh, Japanese words that mean good change. And basically it allows us to get a recorded feedback to a student and just a real brief story. I, I happen to be teaching some very disillusioned students, disenchanted with um, being at school and really they, they, 
it, they just struggled to see um, a direct correlation to what um, was being asked of them and their involvement. And, um, and so I was beta testing some tools. I tended to teach, or I, I still teach, more STEM related uh, courses. And so I was asking my students to do some uh, beta testing of some technical tools. And I said, what do you think about this tool? And this very um, disillusioned student um, said, you know what, when I hear my name in your voice, I know exactly what you mean. He said, but when I see it written on a page, I don't always understand. And that's, that's really stuck with me. And so I think anytime we can add that, that recorded or that extra human layer, I think is the impact really grows. Um, Cindy, what's the name of that tool again? And how Ka Kaizena, um, whoops, so sorry. Kaizena and it's K, uh, yep. Thank you, Weiwei. Weiwei has just put it in the in the chat for all of us. Um, another thing, I just want to be thoughtful of our K-12 uh, colleagues, and especially at the elementary level, y'all are building a lot of stuff and in how to communicate clearly and the expectations that come with that. And so, um, both the professional expectations as well as the student grown-ups, <laughs> uh, the, the grown-ups for the students that you are serving, uh, their expectations as well. And so those weekly announcements will be really important. So um, that is, I just, I, I have a resource for you that you are welcome to uh, include. And if, would, would you all help me? I want to make sure that I'm concentrating on K-12 stuff if we have a K-12 audience. If we're not a K-12 audience, I would just as soon provide those resources to you separately and then, you know, or at a later date. So if you wouldn't mind just in the chat, just saying hi or K-12 or something to give us an indication as to who are, we are, um, that would be fantastic. So if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be great. Or if you're corporate, say you're a corporate. Yes, person. please. That would be great. Yeah. And I'm also looking through the registration list. I think we have a few K-12 folks, but most people I'm seeing here are from higher ed. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Weiwei. Mm -hmm. All right. So again, both that will be an, uh, something available to you as part of our resources, should that be of use to you at a later time. And uh, knowing that we've got more corporate people involved, I'll be sure to uh, speak to that as well. You know, Chelsea can. Uh, only. All right. Chelsea, anything else? No, I think that's great. I think, um, I think this is an important aspect of the H, which is having those clear expectations for students and uh, taking some time to just making sure that they clearly understand what they are because oftentimes we will write a syllabus right and um, think that they're reading it but um, I saw recently a coffee cup that said have you read the syllabus question mark <laughs> most of our students don't read the syllabus as we already know so uh, one of the things I do is I take the highlights out of the syllabus and I turn it into a presentation so that I don't have to wade through everything that I give them all of the highlights. So just, you know, and oftentimes doing a syllabus quiz that also helps me to know that my students have understand what it is that I expect of them. So yeah, that's yeah. great. I'm excited to, to yeah. That yeah, I have also included some, it's a graphic, it's called in a nutshell. And when there's a lot of information, I just synthesize it down you're going to do three things, one, two, three, and say, if you need more details, check the, check up above and then yes. give them the chance to see, right. Yes. Uh, so see these three things, it's in a box, it's been called out, it's interesting to look at, and, um, and it also uh, kind of directs their attention, right. the additional pieces. Yeah. I appreciate all of you commenting in the chat as well. That's incredibly helpful. Yes. All right, um, so the you part of being human, I think we, we, uh, we lose, if, if things are too stale, um, and again, of course, we're talking about a professional use of humor and a professional use of our personality. Um, it's what adds that, that pizzazz, that interest, and 
you know, even something as basic as when I'm talking right now, I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the camera on purpose. I know you are not a dot. Um, I know that you are a person and that adds that extra element. It's part of my personality, right? It's I'm wanting to make that connection. So I'm using that in a professional way. Um, and humor is another way. Um, so again, we all have different work cultures where, you know, I'm a, I work virtually. So for someone to have their child or their dog on their lap, that's just part of a meeting. Um, but not all work cultures are that way. So, you know, taking advantage of those things and asking questions and things like that I think are important. I'll see anything else you do. Yeah, yeah, I think that's also, also when it comes to your backgrounds and uh, I can't have a cat. So this time, because where I live, they already have two cats. And so I'm getting myself a, a stuffed cat, <laughs> like a little, you know, um, stuffed animal cat to have on my desk um, just to make an appearance because so many of my students have cats. And as you mentioned, you know, we have lives. And so using our voice and personality, but also knowing that we're coming, especially for those of us that are doing remote virtual teaching, um, Feel, you know, be comfortable in your space. And if you're not comfortable, get yourself a good background or, you know, some of those things can really help. Um, the green screens I've seen people use as part of their personality. One of my uh, cohorts over at Oregon State oftentimes, you know, cast herself in the green screen um, in the Star Wars Enterprise. <laughs> You know, and it tells you a little bit about her. So uh, I think that's good. And I think people spend too much time worrying also about how they look. I think authenticity is really important when it comes to using your voice and personality, having mm -hmm. who you really are, you know, um, if you're, if, you know, don't try to be something you're not. It'll still come, it'll come across as that to your students because students are obviously so, you know, attuned. So be you. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and you'll notice throughout this presentation, uh, Chelsea and I have our bitmojis in here. Again, that's just a little bit of humor and a little bit of lightness and levity to an important topic. Um, so, yeah. Uh, this is me with too many screens. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so I, I mentioned this just a little bit ago, you know, the importance of monitoring and adjusting and failure. It is not a failure to have a plan B or a plan C. And, um, and so if something doesn't work, you, you did a beautiful job planning. That isn't the point. It just didn't work. So what else can we do? And I think that's the piece of teaching in person, we, uh, we typically have a plan B. We know, okay, so if there's not enough of this resource or we know that this is how this is gonna basically go, um, we have a backup plan. And online, it's no different. Just having that, that extra resource, knowing that turning off a camera in the Zoom, if things start freezing up, yeah, it's just the way it goes. And, um, and I think that adds that, that layer and that extra understanding that we're, we're all coming from different spaces. And different ways. Yeah, and I think this just comes down to having some grace for yourself because you, you can only monitor so much. And so like in a situation like this, we're so very lucky to have so many co-hosts who are watching our Q&A and our chat. Um, and sometimes that's tough to do. And again, you know, part of being human is showing your own humanness and demonstrating that to your students. And so sometimes you will catch things and sometimes you won't. So then I think it helps to really enroll your students in that monitoring and adjusting, like we're doing here, like send something to the chat or if you don't know, you know, so having them be a part of your, your process of monitoring and adjusting mm -hmm. by keeping that collaboration with your students ongoing. Yeah, that's excellent. Uh, I will say um, a, one helpful strategy, if you, again, uh, I'm going to mention Google again, just we happen to be using a Google slide uh, presentation, but there is this option in Microsoft as well. There is something called offline mode. So if this is something that you're sharing later, if your students don't have access to the internet, they can still see it. If you don't have access to the internet for some odd reason, you know, it's still viewable. Um, and, and so having that plan B in place early. That's an easy setting piece within um, 
the tool itself. So something to consider. Another thing to consider would be uh, your alt images. Those are your alternative in images. If something doesn't show up in an online in an online space, simply having it renamed. So if it didn't show up, students are looking at it. Um, they haven't missed what that image is. Um, so this is a goofy picture, by the way. I should, probably should speak to that. I think it's bizarre, honestly, but the thing that I appreciate about it is frogs are not designed to ride bikes, but clearly there's a reason why this frog has decided that's a better, that's that's the best way to, to move forward, um, literally and figuratively in the sense. But um, but again, you know, the, there's that, that adjustment that's happened. Um, so all images, if this image didn't show up, at least we would all know what it is we'd all have an understanding. And if they, we have some, um, we have some physical limitations as to why we wouldn't be able to see uh, an image that would also enable us to be able to, to experience um, and learn alongside. Chelsea, anything else on this? No, I think that's great. I, I just, uh, I think this is an important aspect just being open and honest um, as you're kind of working through um, whatever you're working through online, especially uh, because we're new to it. So, you know, adjustments happen. <laughs> yep, yep. It's not a failure. Absolutely. Nope. All right, um, and I do appreciate this, and we kind of hinted at this just a bit ago, um, you know, taking advantage of our students as monitors, as group leaders, um, those kinds of things. Those of you that are in that corporate space, maybe it's um, you know someone that's already taken a series of courses, or maybe it's um, a designated person per course or per series that can be available for answers beyond an SME, beyond the instructional designer, um, someone that could offer that tangible support beyond technical technical support, of course. Um, you know, something, something to consider. Yeah, um, I do that quite a bit. Uh, and one of the ways I do it in online classes is through breakout rooms, and then I will make um, each week they rotate with a breakout room leader. That way that, you know, everyone gets an opportunity to be an expert uh, in that way. Um, but I, and I find that students take more ownership um, over their class the more that, that they're invited into this collaborative effort um, mm -hmm. and, and encouraged to share their own experience and, and ideas, especially as it relates to the learning in their own real world learning. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And so we all participated together in a, a corporate conversation just through Mentimeter. There are other tools like that, like Poll Everywhere, and of course, Google and Microsoft Forms. Um, or even just discussion groups within an LMS. All of those are, are possibilities and options. Um, and, and Chelsea mentioned workrooms and things like that. So yeah, um, there are some very creative solutions to tech challenges. And one, um, I appreciated there is there an educator that said, you know what, I know I'm not, this is not my jam. This is not what I'm good at. And so they said, hey, these are the tools that we're going to be using. We're going to use five tools this semester or, um, you know, whatever that designated number is. Can anyone be the expert or expert, you know, can you be an expert in one or of these tools? And so students are like, sure, I'll figure out how to use Mentimeter, no big deal. Or I'll, I'll figure out how to submit um, assignments in Microsoft Forms whatever that function is. And then instead of the instructor being the constant technical support, now it's a corporate, it's a community learning space. Um, and, you know, obviously there's got to be some parameters in there in terms of the expectations. If it's an assignment, you know, what, what expectations does an instructor have um, in, around peer interaction and all of that. But all of that to say, having those technical experts within the community is really helpful. Well, those students, nice. those student experts for me too, Cindy, have kind of saved the day many times in my speech classroom when I was struggling in the beginning of teaching um, with, you know, just getting things to work. And I can't tell you how many times students popped up and said, I can fix that for you. And I was just so grateful 
um, and it created that sense of um, camaraderie in the classroom that we were working towards it together. Mm -hmm. um, same thing online. I oftentimes have students will pop in and, and say, if you, you know, if you just do this little thing, and I had no idea. So it's really a cool way to enroll them in this process of learning together. Yes. Yeah. And again, I think that that helps embed that information just that much more. And depending on how that corporate learning is happening, I think there are ways to build community there as well. Um, it is a little more uh, challenging simply because that can be more asynchronous. Um, and I'm, I caught myself, I have a thought on asynchronous in just a second, but um, it, it tends to be a little more asynchronous and individualized learning, which is powerful all by itself. But then what? After you finish that, wh where do they go? Who else has taken that course? Are there other people that they can connect with after that fact? Um, are there any ways that they can share what they now know? And then you're kind of disrupting that forget curve and things like that. Um, so, you know, those are some things to consider. Again, I don't know what your parameters are within that corporate space, but that I think that there are some creative solutions there as well. Um, if I could just interrupt myself, asynchronistic, I, I was just reading the other day, and maybe Chelsea, you saw this as well. Um, instead of asynchronistic, it's learn by yourself. And, um, and so just a little bit more friendly in more human terms, right? Like I'm learning by myself, um, or synchronistic, we're learning together. You know, however that plays forward, I, I think that, that that can be really powerful um, in terms of just, just the basic language that we're using. Yeah. Oh, we're all yeah. using different vernacular and um, we, can, we can still be dental with how we're explaining things. I think that helps because it's clear, asynchronistic and synchronistic do seem to have be jargony, right? And so, uh, so sometimes I really try to remove that jargony language and that's what that does and makes it so much more um, relatable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. All right, so um, I was, so I, I, as Chelsea is, I'm currently teaching um, some uh, online classes and, <laughs> And I was, I was sharing with them because they happen to be um, emerging instructional designers. And I'm like, well, here, you can come and, you know, if you want to participate in any of these sessions to learn my secret. And my secret is I, I, may, I may say the same basic ideas to each student, but I literally am, use their name first. That's where I start. And in Canvas, there, happen, there happens to be a note section when they introduce themselves. I pay attention. My given name is not Cindy. So I pay attention. What is their given name? And I put that in the note section and I refer to that when I re reply to them. So, you know, I have, so, as many of you have, there are some students whose given name and their, uh, their preferred names are not the same. And in, you know, and I don't know what kind of environment you all are in, but, you know, if there's preferred pronouns and, and those kinds of things, paying attention to those details so that we are honoring that person as they would prefer. Um, so I think names is really powerful. Even if it's the same comment over and over again, if I say, Chelsea, have a good day. Tammy, have a good day. Wei Wei, have a good day, right? It's the same thing over and over again, but I've directed it to a specific person as opposed to a generic comment. Yes, and the, and the data shows that people are more responsive uh, when people use their names, which is why salespeople will use your names <laughs> uh, because it creates that relationship. And so that's what that is in, in parts of the humanness of this is creating relationship by using your name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, so we're going to take a small pause, and um, and so want to make sure that we're answering any questions as it relates to just being how we're demonstrating this humanness uh, with students and giving them these substantive uh, responses. I do notice that Becky mentioned that she didn't think that um, all asynchronous activities need to be solo activities or learning on her own. She said she could engage in meaningful um, activities with a class or group in an asynchronous environment. I think that's true. That's true. Um, that was a good, it's a good point to make as well. It, I think we were just trying to help people sort of simplify, but definitely asynchronous also can mean that you can 
do uh, some things in a group um, without being in the room, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I think chats and discussion groups are a beautiful example of that, right? So any, any one of us could start the response and then however long afterwards someone else is replying and it's that ongoing conversation even though it's not just one after the other in a very short amount of time. Right. So yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And Nina said that um, two questions came up. Can Minty uh, be left open for a period of time and used asynchronously? So can you leave yes. it open? Okay. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So you can set the duration or it can be um, eternally open. So that is... And the other was more kind of a comment about using Kahoot. Can you use Kahoot for your syllabus quiz? Um, students love Kahoot. I have used it many times and I use it actually uh, to um, prep students for all kinds of quizzes. So it's one of my favorite tools to use. It is a little time consuming and um, it does cost something if you want to kind of use it fully, but I have found it to be a really helpful um, tool. I'm not sure about you, Cindy, have you used Kahoot before? I have, it's a fantastic tool and I'm also sending uh, another option. So Kahoot is definitely, um, if you're doing it all together, everybody's kind of in that everybody sees each question at the same time. Uh, quizzes is very similar. It's sort of like you have test version A, test version B, and test version C. It's the same questions, they're just they were rearranged. And so quizzes is that same concept, but we all see our own question independently. So we're all competing, um, but that, that competition isn't quite as, it's a little more staggered. Oh, interesting. It's a great, it's a great option. Yes. So those are the only two that I have showing up in questions and answers. Um, if anyone has anything else, we can answer right now in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, so uh, there is a quick question that uh, Casey just asked. She said, can you say more about someone hearing their name versus seeing it on a page or screen? Do you recommend uh, leaving more audio or vi video feedback then? So do you want to start there, Chelsea? Yeah, I, um, I, I think that both ways are good, but I also think, yeah, the hearing it. So is the question, should you leave your audio on? Is that what the question was? So it, they're just asking um, to hear more about someone hearing their name versus just reading it in the oh. impact. And well, I, I just think that one of the exercises I do is an exercise with my students about tell me the story about your name uh, because it's one of it's the first relationship we have with a word like a real serious relationship with a word so i think the reason why that people respond more to it um if, if through hearing it uh, is because we have such a intimate relationship with our name and it it does do what i said earlier which is create a level of relationship that text doesn't do because of our non because of our verbal and nonverbal communication and the ways in which we say someone's name you know so the meaning isn't just in the name but also how we say it right so i think that's why people tend to respond uh, well when i mean that that it develop it creates an opening for a relationship when you hear someone using your name mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I I agree with you completely, Chelsea. And and I think that there, in my mind, um, I think that often people go to the time constraints. Like if I'm going to video record myself, if I'm going to audio record myself for every interaction, how much time is that going to take? And and what what's what am I investing in that? And and ultimately, I think it depends on what we're trying to communicate and what kind of assignment it may be. Um, so that's the caveat. Um, I shared with you earlier about Kaizena and I was doing, I was, I was grading, um, I was giving, hmm, I was grading a pretty involved assignment and I was giving eight to 10 substantive responses. Um, and I, in that particular class at the time, I believe I had 25 students. So it was sort of a dream. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how often we really get 25 students at this point. But, um, and so I timed myself 
and it was the second time I had used that tool. So I understood basically how it used, how it worked. I was able to give eight to 10 quality um, responses to those 25 students in 30 minutes because I was like, this is what I'm gonna say, here's the information. And so I was finding that I could record my voice faster than I could type. So again, I think it also ultimately depends on, there's a little bit of preference mixed in there, but I think that there is also um, what kind of assignment is, is being given. I found to be real successful in that if it's a specific, um, so for example, I, I, I like students to do portfolios. So if they're giving me a portfolio and it's just an update to that portfolio every week, I give them an audio recording of my feedback on that because they're, it's their reflection. So I'm giving them a little more personal response to that. Um, in other assignments, I may or may not give that audio feedback. So again, I, I think that there, there does need to be some flexibility there. I think uh, I've done that as well, where I've given audio feedback to students uh, rather than to type it. And every time I've ever done it, I've gotten a huge uh, positive response something about hearing me say, you know, give them the feedback in that way, just, I don't know, it hit them to be more real. Mm -hmm. So I don't do it for every assignment because it is quite um, time consuming, as you mentioned, Cindy, but, but I think it's worthwhile to do it a couple of times in a class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I want to make sure that we're getting our questions answered. Um, and I want to make sure that we're able to get through everything. Um, so how about, Kelsey, if we do two more questions and then we move on? Does that work? Um, one person, Katrina, asked, uh, what are we using to leave audio feedback? And I've done that in Canvas. Yeah, Canvas is a great way to do that. Um, there are other LMSs that enable you to do that same functionality. Kaizena is one of those tools as well. There are many different options there. Um, I think that field is growing quickly just because we need that human interaction, especially when we're, our face-to-face -face, uh, connections are a little more limited. Yes, right. And Casey mentioned that there's a, usually an option inside of the Canvas the D2L that you can record a comment. Mm. So that's what I was referring to. Thank you, um, Casey, for pointing that out. Yeah, um, and then uh, did we get our two questions? There's Jesse? one more. How about okay. Zoom, Zoom breakout rooms? Do you like those? Zoom, I use them and I love them. Um, yeah, I have used them where they are um, randomized. And I have used them where they are prescribed. So everybody's in the same group each time. And, you know, again, I think that speaks to um, what are you wanting them to do? And who, who do you want them to be interacting with? Um, I, I did learn of a new, I, well, it's new to me idea. Maybe some of you are already using it, where you give each student their own Zoom room and that way they can private message you and you can interact with them. And then as an instructor to make sure that you are part of every single group and you can get into all of them. Um, and it's an easy way for you to monitor. Yes, yeah, as well. So those were the questions. Okay, and I see there are a couple more, but we'll come back to those in a little bit. Okay. All right, so, um, you know, I, I think in order for us to, to give that substantive uh, feedback, we also need to recognize that there is a feedback loop with us as professionals as well, and that impacts the work that we do with students. So we wanna just address that um, as well. And I think quite frankly, this is the harder of the two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree, I agree. Because I think a lot of us, I know for myself, I, I was raised in an educational environment where the teacher was the expert and I since I've become a college instructor uh, I understand that the older I get the less I know and I want <laughs> uh, I want to encourage my students to you know um, um, know that I don't know everything and I think that that helps us to see be more human with them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so I think this is the harder one uh, well not maybe not the hardest but it is a difficult one um, especially if we're all at home all the time and we're not going to an external work area 
Um, having those boundaries is a tricky space, especially when students are online and can access us at any point in time. So having those described um, office hours, having those, um, I'm, I am not going to put my work stuff on my phone because I don't want to be interrupted at the end of the day or turning my phone off, whatever those, those boundaries are for you. Um, I, I learned of a higher ed colleague um, I don't know them personally, so I'll, I'll put that out there, and they're not associated with OSU at all, um, who did office hours, and they did eight to five, three days a week, and I, that's quite a commitment. Um, you're tied to a, a camera and a computer. You can't go and do anything, so I'm not sure that, you know, that would be a recommendation I would give. Um, you know, two hours on a given day is a lot. Um, so maybe even a one hour um, at various points of the day, depending on what time zone your students are in, may be uh, an effective option. Go ahead, Chelsea. <laughs> yes, I, I, I love this topic about boundaries because uh, myself, when I'm talking shop with other instructors, it inevitably comes up, you know, and boundaries around lots of things, um, not only about availability and accessibility, but, you know, we have, as teachers, we are in a, um, we're in a serving profession, so we tend to be very lax with our boundaries, I've noticed, collectively, not everyone, um, but I learned from those um, instructors who have learned to really set good boundaries, and one thing that I Learned is, is I kind of demonstrate what it is that I want my students to do. So I let them know, you know, you um, if you email me during the weekends, you won't get a response until Monday, right? And then I follow through with that. Uh, because what I notice is, is if I start to interact with students outside those boundary times, then, you know, I've broken my own boundaries. So that once you set them with students, you maintain them. Uh, so as a way to demonstrate that, you know, you're taking good care of yourself. And I think that's the other mm -hmm. thing is that we need to learn. The boundaries are about self-care for ourselves mm -hmm. and for students. Yeah. And one of those self-care tools that I have found to be invaluable is a tool called Calendly. There are a couple other tools that are very similar to it. But basically what it does is it pulls from, so I have, um, three work calendars. And so it pulls from all three of those calendars to say um, what my availability is. So I can give a student a link to that and say, make an appointment of 15, 30 or 60 minutes long, um, should they need to do that. And it pulls from all my calendars based on my time and what I'm willing to give. And I can block those times out. I can say on when I'm not available, but I found that to be incredibly helpful versus can we meet? Sure. When are you available? Well, I'm available. And then there's that email interaction back and forth and back right. and forth. I don't have time for that. I'm pretty confident my students don't either. And this is a way of sharing my availability as well as maintaining my boundaries. Thanks, Tammy, for putting Calendly's uh, uh, link there. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Yes. And um, what link do you, what, what app do you use for scheduling those office hours, Cindy? Um, so I'm just, use, so the, the office hours, um, that can be Google? a variety of things. I'm sorry? Do you use Google and then it works with Calendly or? Um, so a Calendly talks to uh, a Google calendar, an online calendar. It, it talks to Microsoft and it talks to, I want to say it's a uh, Yahoo calendar as well. Um, so it does multiple interact uh, integrations. So that's the, that's the beauty of how flexible it is. Um, if you want to set up specific office hour kinds of things, a Google calendar will allow you, you can, it's something called appointment slots. And you can just go ahead and say, here's what I have available, sign up. And, that, and then if no one signs up, you know that those, that's available time. Um, another useful tool is if I'm gonna have a, an online meeting, if no one shows up in the first 10 minutes, um, I cancel that meeting, you know? Like yeah. if they don't need that, that's okay. I don't need to sit there for an hour. Um, so I do that again, too. that's part of those boundaries. And I let students know that that's the case. I tell them that. If, it's, if, you're, if you get there and, you know, and, and no one's shown up, 
Um, but sometimes I will have students who will show up a little bit late and shoot me an email and I'll go ahead and pop in. Another thing I do sometimes is just schedule some time to have an open Zoom um, where I'm just there and I'm working and Zoom is open and it's an hour just like if I was in my office that someone could pop in. So that's another way that I do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and with your camera off, that would, that would work pretty well. Yeah, for sure. All right, unless people wanted to watch you work, I'm thinking <laughs> it's a little bit awkward. Right. All right. So um, this one is is one where, you know, Chelsea and I have been talking about this pretty consistently uh, throughout our conversation this morning is just being gracious with yourself. This is often work that we haven't done to this point. And so we're not going to be as proficient. We aren't going to have all of the answers and that's OK. Um, and, you know, if you're in Oregon and Washington, you know, that's an added layer if you add in the air quality issues uh, that we were experiencing. So how do we provide grace and how do we kind of refill those buckets um, that we need to along the way? And just acknowledging it's okay that we don't know everything. That's okay. <laughs> it's definitely okay. Definitely important, I think, if we're really talking about having students feel as so, um, you know, that we can fail up. We also are we're doing the same thing right along with them. And that requires us to have some grace with ourselves. Right, right, absolutely. All right, and you know, the, we ask our students to be constantly growing and Chelsea used uh, the words at the beginning of our time together of failing forward, um, you know, is just maintaining that for ourselves as well. And, and um, you know, really kind of paying attention to all of those things yeah, because our students are doing a lot right now, and I know that I, I heard from several students this morning who are just sharing their experiences of being students during this time of COVID mm -hmm. and, and all that we're experiencing, um, and that that growth mindset, maintaining that growth mindset is just being willing to, uh, to ask for help also, you know, that it's okay to ask for help, it's okay to say, um, I'm struggling, right? Um, that's how we're growing by being honest as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and this is an area that I think as educational professionals are, is challenging, right? We, we often ask students to do that, um, but we don't necessarily do that for our own professional practice. And so, you know, taking some time, even if it's just a, what went well? and documenting that somehow, whether that's a verbal recording or a bullet journal or whatever that looks like for you, um, I think that there's some, some quality and some benefit to that. Because again, I think that's where that substantive uh, response to students will ultimately come in because you, you're paying attention to what's happening and what you're doing. This one, this one is one that I'm definitely guilty of um, not giving myself enough time because we always are, it seems as though we're always being asked to do more with less, right? Uh, so, so you know, I, I have to schedule in that time for personal reflection, and this is one of the ways that I, I do it, is I actually uh, will schedule it in. Uh, I use monday.com um, for, I don't know if anybody use Monday, but I use Monday um, through OSU, and I will schedule time out for myself and then set reminders and you can do it on your Google Calendar, or whatever, just otherwise I won't do it. So if I, if I don't schedule it, like I schedule everything else, then I won't do it. So that's one way that helps me to really mm -hmm. put the mm -hmm. substantive into it. I actually do it when I schedule it, I'll be committed to doing it. Nice. Yeah. And so one of the things that we'll offer as a resource is um, just some introspection questions to consider um, if this is an area that you want to go ahead and, and continue to grow in. All right, Chelsea, we have just a couple more minutes, but um, just want to sort of remind us all, you know, just like we're doing today and we're networking, there is power in that. And there are other people on that the same journey that may be further down the path or maybe not quite as far down the path as we are. And so having those connections and those um, important conversations are really important. Um, you know, whether that's with our colleagues, 
at wherever it is that we're working or in social media. For me, um, I, I get a ton out of, we have a Slack channel for OSU. I'm paying attention to what people are posting there and the things that they're finding of value. I learn a lot um, through what is shared there, um, but also in, on Twitter. Um, whether you have an account or not, just paying attention to e-learning, that hashtag, or remote learning, or even UDL, there is a ton of people that are talking about these things that I also care about, and they're sharing their ideas and their experiences, which makes me ultimately better at giving that substantive interaction and that quality communication that I want to have with students. Yeah, I'm a big, big fan of social media. And also LinkedIn. So if you're out there and you, I'm on LinkedIn under Chelsea Williams, you'll find me. I love to network via LinkedIn, but I also network on Facebook. I belong to several um, groups who are, especially right now during the pandemic, like the communication instructors online, Facebook groups. You'd be amazed how many of us, um, you know, if you're teaching math or, you know, K through 12 or fifth grade, you will find other groups that are that are um, dealing with the same thing or coming to these types of things you know coming mm -hmm. signing up for these workshops these are ways to network and it really is an important it's an important aspect also to self-care because then you know that you're not in it alone it's hard when you're teaching this way especially mm -hmm. uh, to feel connected in these ways you can start to feel a little more connected to your community mm -hmm. yep agreed agreed all right so these are the things that we shared um, with you today. And so we just wanna take a couple of minutes to answer any questions that did not get answered. Um, um, Tammy, would you like to read, uh, just pick, a, pick out a question that I haven't been answered and share it with Cindy and Chelsea? Sure. Uh, yeah, we had several uh, questions around the breakout rooms um, and how do you go into those breakout rooms and how do you use those? Could you speak to that? Yeah, well, on Zoom, um, there is a button that says when you are the host and you've created um, a meeting that says breakout. And you can choose, once you click that, you can actually have the, you can, you can choose the breakout rooms yourself. So whoever's in the participant screen, you can move them over to the breakout rooms. And what's wonderful about them is, is that you can time them. So for myself, I move my groups and um, I create a breakout and um, they have 10 minutes to discuss. And then once the discussion has reached 10 minutes, it starts to do a countdown at the last 10 seconds. And then all the groups come back together with me online. So it's really great because they get their time, but nobody goes over time because I'm in control of them coming back to the main group discussion. So that's one of the ways I use it. And um, there is a video on YouTube on how to create uh, breakout sessions through Zoom that I could um, also include with some of the resources we're doing here. Thank you. And do you uh, go into the breakout rooms and interact with students or do you find that that's not as effective? I have done that in the past. Um, so it's kind of up to you whether or not, you know, if I'm working, say for example, everyone's broken out because they're working on a project, like a group, say group speech or a group um, project, I may pop in and have a conversation. But if I'm working on trying to get students to have more of a community online i oftentimes will re refrain from popping into their groups because i change the energy and i'm looking to try to create relationships with them online and and i'll bring them back out so only if i i'm needed in the group like if i'm you know just to give them some tips on a particular project but for the most part i stay out of their breakout rooms yeah, I think that's where kind of paying attention to the, the learners and what kind of extra support they may need. I think that's where that's important, especially for younger learners or learners that may be challenged by the technology. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, we've got one minute left, so I think we'll wrap up. Uh, the last question in the chat uh, is about sharing your emails with folks. Would you be willing to do that? Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yep. Mine is chelsea.williams at oregonstate.edu. And Chelsea spelled with a Y, C H E L S E Y, dot Williams at oregonstate.edu. And like I said, you can also find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to friend request me there. So I am putting, 
um, our emails in there and um, in the chat, and you're welcome to connect with us that way as well. Mm -hmm. And if you are on uh, Twitter, I'm absolutely there, and I would love to connect. I'm in, I'm in LinkedIn as well, um, but I put my handle there, my Twitter handles in that chat as well. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Thank you both, um, Cindy and Chelsea. I really hesitate to put a stop on this very good conversation, but we are out of time. I think there are a few more questions that we did not get to, um, but Cindy and Chelsea have, have shared their emails um, to all of you. So if you would like, please feel free to reach out. Um, thank you again both. Um, so um, we'll be sharing the recording as soon as we can. Um, we'll put this on our website probably in the next few days, if not sooner. So um, for now, we're going to close the webinar. Um, again, please feel free to reach out if you like. Thank all you. right. Um, wait, wait. I see that yeah. some people are not able to see uh, the responses. And so I just want to make sure that everybody is able to let, let me. Oh, I see here. Let me just copy this yeah. and make sure that we're sending it to all attendees. There we go. I just flipped oh, did that. Did you do it? So I did. Oh, God. Got it. So got it. Got I want to make sure everybody got that. So. Excellent. Great. I want to sh shout out to Northwest eLearn and yes, thank you thank for giving you. us this opportunity to um, reach out with you and create network and community. Thank you. Yes. So much. Well, it's yes. such a pleasure working with you too. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's been fantastic. So thank you. Thank All right. you. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye for thank now. Thank you. Have Bye. a good day.